Understanding that we wrap into joy of having this joy regardless of circumstances. Um, but I think that's on us, not on them. I don't think happy is a bad translation of the word. I just think it isn't as effective in our time, uh, if that helps. What else? Blessed. Any other thoughts with that? Who doesn't want to be blessed, right? Who doesn't want to receive a blessing? We, we were talking about this um, just with a group of, of pastors and ministers that got together this past Thursday, uh, praying for schools, uh, the school system, and uh, here locally in Sherman. And uh, one, of the, one of the guys, one of my good friends, uh, ended up saying something to the effect of how uh, it's amazing how much we long for the voices of affirmation in our life. Uh, he was talking to a group of men saying how, like, some of these men uh, estranged from their fathers or their fathers ha- have died. And he just asked, what would you give if your father were to come here right now and just simply say, I'm proud of you? Like, and he said that room full of grown men just started crying and, and sharing uh, just how much that means to receive that blessing from their dad. And so that's the kind of weight that we have whenever we come into Matthew 5, is that there's a long history of blessings from God the Father, from earthly fathers. We can, you can read about it from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have these blessings that are passed on. Uh, God rec- uh, Abraham received a blessing from God and then continued to pass it on to his kids and his kids. And so this idea of blessing is rich in our understanding of something that we receive that we really, 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 really want, and it is desirous for us to have. Don? Don? Yeah, have a blessed day. I, I would hope it would mean the same thing because uh, whenever I tell someone to have a blessed day, sometimes I will say to have a good day, uh, but whenever I say have a blessed day, I usually use that in the context of they look tired. Like I'm using it to like the cashier at, at Walmart, at, whenever I frequent Walmart. No, they don't have cashiers anymore, do they? Uh, but, you know, whenever you go somewhere and – you see the person working, the, the, you know, they've been working all day serving tables, and now it's to my table, and you can just tell they're tired, but they're still doing their job. It's hard for me to say have a good day because it's like, yeah, it hadn't been good. It's been work, all right? But I can say have a blessed day, and it doesn't matter if it's good or not. It can be blessed. And so that's my connotation for it, so I would hope that that would be uh, similar in this. So let's read this section, uh, the Beatitudes, and then we will pick up where Rusty left off. I need to turn this clicker on if it's going to work. There we go. I hope I have all of them up. Oh, no, that's last week's. There we go. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you. Notice the the tense change, not tense, uh, uh, the person change. It goes from third person now to second person. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you false, uh, falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So last week, Rusty began talking about each of these blessings. He made it through verse 6. So we're going to pick up with verse 7 which I will get there in his slides in just a second. There we go. So verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, 
for they shall receive mercy. Kind of sounds like what goes around comes around, right? But in a good way. Like sometimes whenever we talk about what goes around comes around, we're talking about it in a negative context. But this one actually seems positive. When you are merciful to someone else and you have been seen as a merciful person, others tend to respond to you the same way, right? Have you noticed that? So I'm debating on an email, how to word an email uh, that I got a response to uh, just this past Friday. I asked uh, for the soccer uh, soccer organization. I'm a coach. I've uh, been doing that for years. And uh, I asked for a schedule change because they have a, a game for us the afternoon, uh, Saturday afternoon before Easter. Well, three of our girls that are on the team are also at LTC with me. And I'm like, that's three. That's all my subs. And I know of at least two others that are going to be gone. I don't, have a, I don't have a team to play. And so I requested a schedule change. I've done this multiple times. No problem. In fact, in my 11 years of coaching, never been a problem. I get an email response back saying the other coach is unwilling to change, change the schedule. And it's a first for me. And I'm like, that tells me so much about this coach because I'm taking it, there is no mercy. I bet you he doesn't receive much mercy because he doesn't seem to be a merciful person. Now that's one interaction, but I tell you what, one interaction taints the view of someone that I've never really met. But that's how I'm going to view him until I know otherwise. That's what we do, right? But when someone's merciful... We have a very different relationship uh, with them at the beginning. Walt? Agreed. Well, I I don't know what all was said because we're going through the organization and the proper channels to get there, and so I'm going through a mediator, as it were, and so that's why I'm trying to figure out the, the email of how to... Scratch into that. But regardless, it's those types of things that we can do even offhandedly that would stop us from receiving mercy because we're not seen as being merciful. So uh, let me ask you this. Do mercy and forgiveness have anything to do with each other? Would you think so? And if so, how so? Mercy and forgiveness. Do they correlate, correspond, work together? What do you think? They should? Okay. Jim? Yeah, so grace is a is good understanding that we can also uh, interchange with this idea. Okay, why so? I think you're on to something. Can we put more words into that? I don't think you can forgive without mercy. Why? Any, any, anyone? I think, that, I think that's a true statement. Anyone able to say why that is the case? Right? Keep going. So you feel like they have done something wrong, and then what else? Okay. uh, Maybe it's not forget, but what we have to do is have mercy in the situation. Meaning, what do they have to do to receive forgiveness from me? Nothing. Okay, that's a misnomer a lot of people uh, get wrong is we think that forgiveness is contingent upon whether the person deserves it, whether the person uh, does anything for it. No. That may be a path of reconciliation, and that may just be good human decency, but there is no requirement in Scripture that the other person needs to do anything for you to forgive them. Nothing. In fact, the requirement is you must forgive them, and if you don't, there's a problem with you, not with them but only once. 
<laughs> All right, Peter. <laughs> Hold on, we got, got another scripture to go to for Walt. <laughs> How many times do I forgive? Uh, no, the, but the idea is you cannot forgive without mercy because the act of forgiveness is an act of mercy. That is what's going on, Jim. Right. And and that forgiveness doesn't mean, and mercy even doesn't mean that there is no consequences for actions. Um, That is definitely uh, part of it for sure. Uh, Matthew 6, 14, just to add a thought to this. Yes, ma'am. By the way, it's so good to see you this morning. (laughs) Yeah, we've been missing you. So continue on with your comment. Oh, no, you're fine. Right. Right. So, so what, uh, what's been brought up here is that the forgive and forget idea that we've often heard is not, I, I'm going to put these words, I don't think that's humanly possible. We don't have the capacity to forget, especially harsh things against us. It's not how we're hardwired. It's not how God created us. And I think that's for a reason, and I think it's for a good reason, is because every time we remember, we have the opportunity to practice mercy and forgiveness again. This is why it's more than once, because sometimes it's a daily reminder that I need to keep on forgiving this person because I haven't forgotten what has happened, but that memory serves as a positive reinforcement for me to forgive and have mercy. So yeah, great, great point there. Looking at Matthew 6, um, again, what, what Jesus would say later on in the Sermon on the Mount, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Those who forgive will be forgiven. Those who are merciful will be shown mercy. You see the connection here? Now, are there other ways to show mercy other than forgiveness? Of course, we talked about a few of them at the beginning. There's plenty of ways to show mercy. But the idea is, show mercy, and you will be shown mercy. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. This is a uh, very easy equation in Scripture. John? John? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, there, uh, there's probably more to unpack in that than than we have time for. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a shot. For one, um, they, there's it's partly this question. What John brings up is of, is verse 15. I have a hard time understanding it. Like, haven't my sins already been forgiven? Isn't that what being washed by the blood of Jesus does? It takes care of past sins and any future sins. Yes. Uh, But part of the question inherent with with what you're asking is, is this idea, can I lose my salvation? Can I still fall away once I am in? Uh, If you went to the Telling a Story conference, there was a fantastic class on that taught by uh, my my good friend Wes, uh, preached down at uh, McDermott Road. Wes did a great job walking through Hebrews showing in Hebrews, almost every chapter has a line or two about don't fall away. You can fall away. And so if you can fall away, that means that sin can still wrap you up. Now, if sin can still wrap us up, then what's happening here, I believe, 
is it, it's about the direction we're going. So whenever I'm chasing after God, but I take a little detour of sin, but I keep my eye on God going, oh, God, that was wrong. I'm going to come back. That is the continual perpetual forgiveness of my future actions and what I'm currently in that will lead me toward the path of heaven, path of God, and the forgiveness is still there. But when I choose not to forgive someone else, I don't just take a little detour. What I end up doing is this. And whenever I do this, God's forgiveness can't reach me because it has, I, I need to receive it. Okay, So if that helps a little bit, there's more to unpack with that, but there's your uh, two-minute all right, let's look at the next, next one. Uh, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What does it mean to be pure in heart? What do you think? No, not what? Not two-faced. Not two-faced, so not hypocritical, not two-faced. Okay, what else? Pure in heart. What was that? All right, so it, it's an attitude or a, a direction of, of facing toward God and doing your absolute best for him, with him, uh, because of him. What else? You think of children? Yeah. And, I, and I'm glad. I, whenever I, in my mind, uh, this is the difference. This is the reason I'm not a nursery worker is because whenever, whenever I think of little kids, I think of all the poop that I have to clean up and the screaming. And so I'm, my, my vision goes to hell rather than heaven. And I know it's pure in heart, but like, bless your heart that you go that way and I don't. I, uh, but I, I, uh, you're right. That is a beautiful picture. And we know that. In fact, Jesus would even back you up, not me, in that saying, let the children come to me. Yeah, I didn't. Well, yeah, there's a couple places, but that's for another. Not there. <laughs> Pure in heart. What else? Your devotion to Jesus. Yeah. I just had, had a thought. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the lyrics to that, that song. Um, I mean, obviously, pure in heart, oh God, help me to be. Oh, where's letter P? 671. I'm not going to sing the song. I just want to look at the lyrics. Pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be. May I devote my life wholly to thee. Okay, I think that's a pretty good understanding of what being pure. Watch thou my wayward feet. Guide me with counsel sweet. Pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be. Pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be. Teach me to do thy will most lovingly. Be thou my friend and guide, let me with thee abide. Pure in heart, help me to be. Pure in heart, O God, help me to be, that I thy holy face may one day see. Keep me from secret sin, reign thou my soul within. Pure in heart, help me to be. I think that's a pretty good explanation. Um, I think we can roll with that. So now let's ask this question. What does it mean to see God? Or maybe better said, why? Why will the pure in heart see God? Not, they're not ashamed? Okay. Matthew? Okay, I like that. Because they know they're not God. Agreed. Yeah. And I, I do really like that thought because a lot of times we, we take on godly characteristics as we should, but sometimes we take them on in the wrong way and we think that we are God or we're not in need of him. But that's not a pure heart. A pure heart is going to recognize, I am not God. It's a humble approach. And when you recognize you're not God, but you're seeking God, then you will see God because you're actually looking for him. I like that. What else? 
What else does it mean? Why, why, will, they, why will they see God? Any other thoughts with that? All right, so it seems the only way to have a pure heart, according to the song especially, how much of that song focused on God's redemptive power and God's helping in this? I mean, this is coming also from, uh, King David will say, created me a clean heart, O God. This is not something I can do on my, my own, and so my whole focus is upon God. And if your whole focus is upon God, guess what you're going to see? You're going to see God. And now this may be Moses' mountaintop see God, although he, uh, there's a case in point that actually he maybe didn't see God. He saw the afterglow of God, the after effects of God, but that was closer than any other human had seen. Um, and so you may have that kind of experience, or it may just be that you see the effects of God. You see where God has been working, but when you see that, you are seeing God at work, which is very similar in the idea, because God is always at work. This is who God is. So, yes, Greg. Mm. That's a great title, Romans 1. Yeah, so, so Romans 1 kind of flips this a little bit, of saying that God's invisible works can be seen, but those who refuse to see God, their hearts will be darkened. That's really fascinating. I've never seen that tie before, but you're right. Romans 1 flips this of saying that if you're not searching for God, you're, you're, you're not going to have a pure heart. That's great. So thank you for that. I, I really like that one. In the I don't want to run out. Rusty said I have to finish the Beatitudes today, so I don't want to run out and get the wrath of Rusty because um, he, he may be little, but he's fierce. Um, so, <laughs> um, but let me, let's continue on with this next one because this next one uh, boggles my mind and is fascinating. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. What, how can... I need to start with this question. What is a peacemaker? Okay, simple. Someone who makes peace. Let me give an, an uh, compare and contrast. What is the difference or similarities between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper? Besides one is a gun. Don't go there. <laughs> one uses force if necessary. Which one? Peacekeeper? Okay. One's going to have the ability to forgive and the other not so much. So which one will be able to forgive? Peace. Okay. One is active, one is passive. Great. Yes. Because you're definitely, you're definitely right. Keeping, holding on to something is passive. Making it is active. What else? So what? That lets you have to choose some shoes of peace. Jaws of peace. Oh, yeah. You remember my lessons better than I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 the whole armor of God. Um, mm -hmm. Giles? Okay. 
All right, so a uh, peacekeeper maintains the status quo, often to the overlooking of the main issue even, uh, and, and the problem. So um, in, no, that, that's not a fair question. I'm not going to ask that. Uh, I'll, I'll just say, what, instead of asking a question, I will say this. As a general rule, in churches, not just here, in churches, people, and especially leadership, gravitate toward one of these rather than the other. Which one would you guess? Peacekeeping. And this shows up multiple ways, doesn't it? Well, we don't want to offend so-and-so because they're a big donor. They give a lot of money, and so we need to keep the peace with them. Again, this, I'm not saying this about here, okay? Please, I'm just giving examples, all right? Um, this person, you know, their, their, their dad was the, was the founder, was the beginning of this church. And um, so if... if if she wants the carpet to be red, the carpet's going to be red because it's better to keep the peace than to upset that apple cart. You see it in a lot of different ways. I, I, Mom, go for it. You've got stories. <laughs> okay. We will never hear the end of it from this person because they are loud about it. They are the squeaky wheel. And so we're going to give it some grease, and that grease is called peacekeeping, not peacemaking. Peacemaking is a harder process. In fact, peacemaking might actually look a little bit like troublemaking while it's happening. What I mean by that is Look at the life of Jesus. I believe Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker. But whenever he stepped into situations, a lot of people said, that's a troublemaker. And Jesus wasn't making trouble. He was highlighting the trouble that was already there so that he could assess it and address it and fix it so that true peace could come. This is why I believe the Jesus movement is a unity movement because it upsets the status quo of saying, well, there should be a rich church and a poor church. Oh, there should be a white church and a black church. Oh, there should be a this and a, and a that. There should be all of these things. And Jesus comes in and says, you know what, for my followers, I'm going to have a, a, a few people that were probably really good businessmen. And I'm, I'm going to have a few people that no one knows what they did. In fact, they might not have done anything. They may have been homeless at this time. And just said, come follow me. I'm going to choose those people too. I'm going to choose the people that will bring together this unity. I'm going to choose a zealot and a tax collector. Two diametrically opposed foes who would now be in the same unity movement. And you've got to know that Jesus stepped into that and welcomed them in such a way that they couldn't shake it off. Colossians 1, 19, Walt. Right. No, like that is, again, uh, this is why it's easier to keep the peace. Then, then to make the peace, we can demand. We can demand that you do everything like we want. You go to a foreign country, there are certain things you're going to do out of respect for tradition. Uh, you're going to, like, um, oh, dear me, Jim Lightfoot's uh, grandson and wife came and spoke to the uh, men's breakfast, and she told us her story. And she was talking about the, uh, the hijab, the, the, the scarf that the ladies would wear, and uh, why she would wear it because she had to at a certain age. Like it was forced upon her. That is peace keeping. If you have to force people to do the things your way, then you are just keeping peace. 
or forcing them to do something to, for the other. You're just keeping peace. You're not making peace. And peace isn't always compromise. Please don't hear that. Peace isn't always compromise. Uh, it's a, a lot of collaboration, and it's a lot of searching the third way. A lot of times in peacemaking, we say, well, it's either going to be, the carpet's either going to be uh, red or it's going to be yellow. That's bad choices of carpet. Uh, compromise would uh, just simply say, well, you know, we're going to make it orange because that's a mixture of the two, and surely we'll, we'll be good on both sides. No, it's not always that because then everyone's like, oh, uh, that's dumb. Why would we do orange? Maybe collaboration is an act of saying, what do you want about red? What do you want about yellow? Hey, did you both know that everything that you want can be accomplished by green? Not a color that anyone had on their radar. Okay, this is a really bad illustration. But that can also be what peacemaking is about, finding that third way, finding a different way, or just saying, look, we're not going to have carpet. We're just not going to have carpet. We're going to go stamp concrete. You know, it's going to be fine. Um, there might be another way. Okay, Colossians 1, 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The just, even simply the act of Jesus going to the cross is not a peacekeeping idea. Jesus rocked the world when he went to the cross. Literally. There was an earthquake. And by doing so, he made peace. This is what Jesus is doing. Okay, I'm running out of time. I wish I could sit on that one more because it's probably my favorite one, but let's continue on. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad which is another way to say, be blessed. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you seek to do what is right and act justly, some are going to disagree with you. Some are going to disagree with your form of justice. If you seek to be merciful to others, some will be threatened by you who show mercy. If you walk into a conflict and attempt to create peace, some people are going to get angry with you as a result. If you follow the way of Jesus, what the Beatitudes are saying is you will be persecuted because Jesus was persecuted. So let me ask this. How should you expect to be persecuted today? If this you is literally us, how should we expect to be persecuted today? Any thoughts? (laughs) Yeah. So we live in a post-Christian world, meaning we used to have Christian values and more uh, commonplace in our world, but they are seemingly gone. It's still built upon that system, but it's fading is maybe the best way of saying a post-Christian idea. And and we look at the world and uh, the world will tell us, well, we're just wrong for some of our views that we hold uh, closely. And here's the thing, it's not just the world. There's also... Some hard, I'm going to call them hardcore nationalistic Christians that try to tell me as well that I am wrong because I follow Jesus in what he says, rather than following them in their conclusion toward who should be president or whatever on the political scale. We can get persecuted from both sides. And in fact, I think that should be what we expect when we're doing it right. The religious zealots didn't like Jesus, neither neither did the Roman uh, authorities. He offended both sides. We can expect to be persecuted from all angles. (laughs) 
Right. So the whole idea of absolute truth and all those types of things, uh, there, there's a lot that we see. I think a lot of times we cry persecution more than it really is. I mean, we, pi- pri- we cry persecution whenever it's minor inconveniences. That, uh, you know, different things, something that happens at Starbucks and we're like, oh, per- I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. No, you're not. That's not how that works. But there is persecution. And there's persecution that we can expect. And if we expect it, maybe we can have the view that the disciples did in Acts 5. Check this out. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. This is the religious leaders that are doing this, by the way. Don't speak in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. They left, I feel like that needs to be emphasized. They left the Sanhedrin after being beaten, after being flogged, rejoicing, being blessed, hearing the Sermon on the Mount and putting it into action. They left rejoicing because they have been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. When you expect to be persecuted, when it happens, what ends up happening is you often Receive it with blessing. And I think that's what the Beatitudes are telling us. There's a lot of things that are going to happen in your life, but whenever you know who's in charge and what God is doing, and that you expect that because you're following God, things aren't always going to work out your way, when they don't work out your way, you can actually look at it and say, I am following Jesus because the exact same, well, maybe not exact same thing, the same things happen to him. I am following in his footsteps. When you expect to be persecuted, then you can be blessed when you are. Beatitudes have a lot to t- continue to teach us. But in honor of uh, Rusty's request, I have finished the Beatitudes, and if you want to uh, continue on with that study, read more. Read it. Read the studies on it. There's so many books and so many wonderful commentaries about this. Rusty will pick up uh, the story of the Sermon on the Mount next week. So be blessed.